Haggai chapter 2, verses 10 to 23, page 840. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet. This is what the Lord of hosts says. Ask the priests for a ruling. If a man is carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and with his fold touches bread, stew, wine, oil, or any other food, does it become holy? The priests answered, no. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priests answered, it becomes defiled. Then Haggai replied, so is this people and so is this nation before me, the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands, even what they offer there is defiled. Now reflect back from this day. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you, all the work of your hands, with blight, mildew and hail, but you didn't turn to me, the Lord's declaration. Consider carefully from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider it carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? The vine, the fig, the pomegranate and the olive tree have not yet produced, but from this day on, I will bless you. The word of the Lord came to Haggai a second time on the 24th day of the month. Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. I'll overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I'll overturn chariots and their riders. Horses and their riders will fall, each by their brother's sword. On that day, the declaration of the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, the Lord's declaration, and make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we've come to the end of our series in Haggai, only a short book, but it's fairly punchy, isn't it? Uh, You've got an outline there inside your newsletter, uh, some household questions up on the top right. If you missed any of the sermons or you want to catch up, uh, please feel free to hop on our website and watch them. God willing, there'll be an opportunity for brief questions at the end of this. Uh, Charles Sturt University celebrates it on the 20th of July each year. Norfolk Island hold theirs on March the 6th each year. In Japan, it's February the 11th every year. And Western Australia, which has aspirations for nationhood, celebrates it on June the 1st each year. Foundation Day. Foundation Day. A day when a group of people stop and they look at the past, they gaze at the present and they glimpse into the future, remembering how they are who they are. It celebrates something significant. Uh, It might be the establishment of a university, a settlement on an island, a nation, a state. And at that moment when they gather for Foundation Day, as they look back to the past, as they consider the present, as they look to the future, they think about who they are, what they are, and why they do what they do. On the 24th day of the ninth month of the second year of Darius, Haggai proclaims Foundation Day for a bunch of ragged, dispirited exiles in a city that is only a shadow of what it once was. And Haggai says, remember this day. And we're going to look at it today. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. I thank you that we can read it. Thanks for Haggai, Uh, two chapters, uh, a number of words from you, but short, sharp and punchy, and so 2022. Father, thank you for reminding us of the building project. Thank you for reminding us that appearances are both disappointing and deceiving. Thank you for showing us our foundation day. Please help us to live that out in Jesus' name. Amen. That point two on the outline, the word of the Lord uh, has come through Haggai the prophet. 
Uh, it began on the 29th of August, 520 BC. God's people had been back in the land that was theirs for 19 years. Uh, they'd been sent off into exile, uh, God's fatherly discipline, because they'd treated God lightly. They'd taken God for granted. They'd assumed that his presence would be a blank check for forgiveness any day they wanted. And so God had disciplined them because they didn't represent him to the world like they should have. At the heart of their exile wasn't necessarily the loss of their homes or their paddocks or their bank accounts. It was the loss of a whopping great big building in the centre of their capital, the temple. They'd lost the temple. I mean, it's very hard to lose something that big, isn't it? But they'd lost it. Now, the temple was a picture in the middle of their capital city of two things, wasn't it? God wants to live with his mob and God will deal with the problem that stops them hanging out. Sin. In essence, it was a massive big picture of God's grace. And as God's people lost that picture of God's grace, as they went away to 70 years out of the land, they began to question his promises, his desire, the very character of God. But God brought them back 19 years ago, returned them to the land, and he returned them to the land with one job, build the temple. And as they built that temple, they would show to the world that they'd understood their judgment, that they'd understood God's grace, that they took their sin seriously, that they were committed to dwelling with God. But what had they done for 19 years? They'd polished their own floorboards, hadn't they? They'd made sure that their gardens looked on point. They had the best technology and they'd neglected the house of God. For 19 years, they'd been committed to their own building projects and neglected God's. For 19 years, they had had building projects that said, look at how significant we are, and had ignored the significance of God. And so God's word comes. Haggai confronts the people with a very clear word, reminds them of God's judgment. It wasn't an economic downturn. It was his discipline. And as they hear God's very clear word, they fear him and they come back to commit to building the house. But it's not been easy, has it? Appearances are disappointing. And the Lord reassures them that he is with them. They are to be brave and courageous and to build because he will come and shake the earth and he will bring a temple and a peace to pass that is so much more glorious than they could ever imagine. Appearances are deceiving, and they had to trust him and get on with the job. Well, the word of the Lord comes a third time through Haggai. I'm at point three on the outline. The precise date is mentioned there in verses 10 and 20. Uh, There are two words on this day, and the date in our calendar is the 18th of December, 520 BC. And this time there is no religious festival, but it's a festive day. Look there in verse 18. Consider carefully from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it carefully. What's happened on this day? They've finally got the foundation laid. They've finally put the stones down. This is foundation day. Only two months after they stood deflated and disappointed and defeated, they've worked so hard that the foundation stones of the new temple are there in front of them. It's a day to remember. It's a day to look back. And did you see the exhortation there in verse 15? Consider carefully, reflect back from this day. As you look at those big stones, look back. And to aid their reflection, the word of the Lord brings them some truths in the form of two questions there in verse 10. This is what the word of this is what the Lord of hosts says. Ask the priest for a ruling. If a man's carrying consecrated meat in the fold of his garment, and with his fold touches bread, stew, wine, or all, or any other food, does it become holy? The priest answered, No. Nah. Then Haggai asked, if someone defiled by contact with a corpse touches any of these, does it become defiled? The priest answered, it becomes defiled. 
Now, Haggai's talking in categories we don't use that often. Uh, We don't often use those words consecrated or defiled. Uh, Literally consecrated, holy, defiled, unclean. Uh, They're the categories God used with his people to help them understand where they stood with him. Uh, For something to be consecrated or holy means that it's been set apart for God's work. Uh, It's acceptable for God to use by God to be in the presence of God. For something to be defiled or unclean, uh, that means it is so tainted and damaged and stained by sin that God can't use it. Uh, It can't be in the presence of God. Uh, It can't be used by God. They're the categories Haggai is talking in. And I want you to notice that he has a concern for the third level of contact. Did you notice that? Both of them. Something touches something, consecrated or defiled, and then touches another thing. Can I pass on the quality it's picked up? Can you transmit holiness? Can you pass on uncleanness? And the answers are there again very simply in verses 11 to 13. God wants his people to remember a point. Can holiness be transmitted easily? No way. Not a chance. Can defilement be transmitted easily? Too right. Every time. The conclusion is there in verse 14. Then Haggai replied, So is this people. So is this nation before me, the Lord's declaration. And so is every work of their hands, even what they offer there is defiled. Do you see the tense? It's present tense, but talking about their history. And God doesn't beat around the bush. The nature of these people gathered together to celebrate the laying of these foundation stones, the nature of these people is they are unclean. They are sinners and rebels. They are people at war with their God. You notice he's not talking to the world out there. He's not talking to Darius over in the Persian capital. He's talking to his mob, gathered in his presence, at his house. As God's people, they'd persisted in their nature of rebellion and they despised the goodness of the God who wanted to live with them. Everything they touch is stained. Everything they touch is stained. Everything is tainted by their sin. No exception. Everything these people think, create, feel, communicate. Everything these people desire, construct. Everything by their nature is defiled by their sin. Do you see their impossible situation? Even the sacrifices for their sin are unacceptable. Did you see that in verse 14? And what hope is there for a people if everything they touch, even the sacrifice of their best breeding stock, and that is unacceptable to go, oh, how will their sin ever be dealt with? How can they ever hope to dwell in the presence of God? What hope do they have when even the things that they bring, their very best things, are so tainted by sin that God says, I can't use that. It's not acceptable to me. What hope can they have? And God has been calling them back to himself in a really clear way. Look at verse 15. 
Now reflect back from this day. Before one stone was placed on another in the Lord's temple, what state were you in? When someone came to a grain heap of 20 measures, it only amounted to 10. When one came to the wine press to dip 50 measures from the vat, it only amounted to 20. I struck you, all the work of your hands, with blight, mildew, hail, but you didn't turn to me, the Lord's declaration. Look at your history. And as you look at it, look at it through the lens of my relationship with you. It's not been an economic downturn. It's not been a bad season. It's not been a cultural shift. It's not even been a plague of pestilence. What it has been is a father saying to his children, please come back to me. Please come and live with me. Please return to the one who can deal with your greatest problem. And what did they do every time? They didn't come back. A tainted people, defiled by their very own nature, an impossible situation, damaged by their very own rebellion, a history of stubborn resistance to God's discipline to bring them back. And now on foundation day with those stones just shining with the way they're dressed, lying in front of them, that very action of putting those stones down shows that these people are finally listening. They've thrown themselves upon God's mercy. They've heard his very clear word and they fear. And do you notice the reassurance of God in verse 18? Consider carefully from this day forward. Do you notice the change here? We're not looking back anymore, are we? From this day forward. Let's look at the present. From the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Stop. Consider it carefully. Is there still seed left in the granary? No, there isn't. The vine, the fig, the pomegranate, the olive, well, they haven't produced a thing. But what's God going to do? From this day on, I'll bless you. By nature, they are sinful. By history, they're rebellious. By natural works, they have nothing to earn God's favour or produce it. All of their storehouses are empty. But as they put that foundation stone down, God says, I'm going to bless you. I approve of you. I welcome you back to hang out with me. God is saying very clearly, I've dealt with your sin. As you have thrown yourself upon my mercy, hearing and fearing and then getting on with the building project, out of my abundant, overflowing grace, kindness and love, I am wiping that debt out. My grace is sufficient to deal with your sinful nature, your rebellious history your complete emptiness when it comes to your barns and your good deeds, and I say, you're mine. I love you. My grace brings you home, and you'll remember this day forever. They've looked at the past. They've considered the goodness of the present. And then God gives them a vision for the future. I'm at point four on the alarm because on the very same day, another word comes, verse 20. And the Lord turns from talking to the people and he talks to one man in particular, Zerubbabel, the political leader of the people. Uh, Even his name's a conundrum because it means literally born in Babylon. (laughs) He's not even born in the promised land. And God turns to him and he speaks to him and he raises an image that he's already used. Did you see it there in verse 21? Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. We know that image, don't we? We've seen that image, haven't we? We've already dealt with that image in chapter 1 and chapter 2 where God has talked about his shaking, meaning his coming. Uh, The world shakes when God comes. We've seen that in history, haven't we? In the Exodus, at Mount Sinai. And when God comes, 
He'll deal with all the pretenders to his throne. Look in verse 22. I'll overturn royal thrones and destroy the power of the Gentile kingdoms. I'll overturn chariots and their riders' horses and their riders will fall, each by his brother's sword. Uh, God is basically going, uh, Psalm 2, you know that psalm you sing whenever the king is put on the throne, the bloke descended from David? Uh, You're going to see that with your very own eyes. Every pretender to the power of God is going to be crushed. Uh, In case you doubt that, let me just remind you of your history. What happened when you came out of Egypt? You got to that sea. It was an impossible situation, wasn't it? Impossible. Pharaoh's army this side, impassable sea this side. What did God do? Well, he opened up the ocean, Exodus 14, didn't he? And they rode into there, those Egyptians, and God overthrew them and they were wiped out. Another impossible situation. Hey, Gideon, 300 men will do it. You'll be able to wipe out the Midianites, thousands upon thousands of them, 300 will do it. What happened that night as as Gideon crushed those pots and held up those lamps and they blew those trumpets? The Midianites turned on each other, just what this verse says, and with their own swords killed each other. And in each of those instances, Psalm 2 and and at the sea and and with, with Gideon, who was actually fighting? The Israelites did nothing. And God came and fought for them in an impossible situation and wiped out their enemy and said, you're my mob. And on that day, notice we're in the future, on that day when God comes and shakes the world and overthrows all pretenders to his throne, what will God do in verse 23? On that day the declaration of the Lord of hosts. I'll take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, my servant, the Lord's declaration. I'll make you like my signet ring, for I've chosen you. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. The signet ring? (laughs) It's just the ring, just the ring the king wears. And so that when he passes a law or sends correspondence, he seals it with his sign. This has all the authority of the king behind it. But we we miss some of what's going on here because we forget Jeremiah 22, verse 24. I'm not going to read it, but write it down. Because as God kicked his people out of the land, those 70, 80 years before, God said, "I'm, I'm ripping off my signet ring. The king from the family line of David, I'm ripping you off, mate. You're gone. And the next descendants of David in that family line from that king who'd been ripped off his throne and sent into exile, the next men, men like Shealtiel, Zerubbabel's father, never saw the throne. They were never kings. They lived in exile. Their children were born in exile under the discipline of God. But what's God done? He's brought the family home. He's put them in the land. The house is being built and the signet ring goes back on. The discipline has been done and the promise stands firm. Zerubbabel, you'll be my signet ring. What a day. I'm at the last point on the outline. What a day. Foundation day. On this day, the stones of the foundation of the temple were finally dressed and set in place. On this day, God got his people to look at their past and to know their impossible situation. He brought them to the present and they met his amazing grace and he took them to the future and he showed them a vision where their king would rule rule forever. And how did that pan out? Well, by the end of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament, they're back in drought. The silos are empty again. Zerubbabel was never a king. He was just a governor of a Persian province and the temple. The Jews didn't finish it. But those corrupt kings in the family line of Herod who wanted some political influence, they finished them off. The crops, uh, never as bountiful. God's people still the whipping boys of the region. What happened to that foundation day? On one level, God's people again, wandered. Does that sound familiar? They forget foundation day. 
They heard it, they feared it, they built it, and then they went back to their floorboards, back to their gardens, back into the fear of the appearances of disappointing, back to drawing in the wagons of the good old days, back to remembering the promises of God lightly. But Foundation Day is still in the calendar and the words of the Lord remain. And like we heard two weeks ago, some angels came to sing to a bunch of shepherds. Appearances are deceiving. They sang of a king born down the road in David's city, the king promised by God who would save the world. And the shepherds went and saw that king and they praised God. And that king grew up and we heard part of his first sermon this morning, didn't we? Blessed are you. That king's focused on blessing. Does that sound familiar? From this day on. And those first people who heard that first sermon, those 12 men and the other hangers-on, had nothing to recommend them, did they? Fishermen and tax collectors and sinners, except that they were seated with the king. And the king was crowned, wasn't he? On a cross, and the earth shook. And the king was raised, and he walked out of the grave. And on that day, the earth shook. And that king lived and died and rose because he suited up in an impossible situation and went and fought for his people and beat an impossible enemy they could do nothing about. That king lived, died and rose so that the last great pretender to the rule of God, sin and death, could be cast into oblivion. That king lived, died and rose so that the great desire of God to dwell with his mob and the great impossible obstacle to that desire, sin, could be dealt with. That king lived, died and rose so that he could be a foundation stone of a brand new temple for God, the people of God, where God would hang out with his mob and show that sin had been beaten and that temple would stand wherever it met to show the world this is God. That king is Jesus, not Zerubbabel, but same family tree. His death and resurrection is our foundation day, isn't it? Hold on to that foundation day. And whenever it happens, look back, look here, and look forward. Here's what that might look like very quickly. Live the blessed life. If you don't know what the blessed life is, it's not living your best life now. It's there in Matthew 5. It's the life of mourning and humility. It's the life of looking at the world and being saddened by sin, but knowing the one who beats it. It's the life of approval because your king has gone into battle for you and your sins are forgiven. Be assured. All your sins are forgiven in Jesus by God's grace alone. By his kindness, your history of rebellion is wiped out. Your nature, which breaks everything it touches, is changed and your future dwelling is already built. So live the blessed life now and be assured of complete forgiveness in Jesus. But please take sin and holiness seriously. By your nature, by my nature, I break everything I touch. I leave a stain that is worse than mulberries or beetroot. It makes everything I bring before God inconsequential. 
and I can only dwell before him because of his grace. Take holiness seriously. It is incredibly hard won by the death of the king. And as we are assured of our forgiveness and as we live the blessed life and as we take sin and holiness seriously, what should we do? Get on with the building project. Pursue the kingdom of God. Be a dwelling place in Narrabride that says, have you met Jesus lately? Would you like to have complete and utter peace because of a king who does it all for you? And remember your foundation day. Let me pray. Father, thanks for your word. Thanks for foundation day. It seems funny to describe a life, a death and a resurrection as a day, but... Father, that is the moment when your desire to dwell with us is fulfilled because our sin is forgiven. Father, reassure us that in Jesus every one of our sins can be forgiven. Father, help us to live the blessed life, the life of your approval in this world. Father, give us hearts and minds and hands that flee from sin and take holiness seriously. And as we live these things, Father, help us to be diligent builders, to be a temple that is going up in the middle of Narrabride that says to this town, hey, here's God. He loves you and he wants to live with you. Come and meet him. Amen.